Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, today I will do two almost identical verses which are in Surah An-Nisa, the chap fourth chapter, and Surah Al-Maida, the fifth chapter of the Quran. Uh, both verses are talking about the same theme. The Almighty is saying, Ya yuhallazina amanu, believers, kunu qawwamina bil qisti shuhada alillah. Be firm on justice by becoming representatives of God. The verse in Surah Shuhada, Surah Al Maida says, Ya yuhallazina amanu, believers, kunu qawwamina lillahi. Shuhada bil qist. Be firm for the sake of God, becoming His representatives in implementing justice, truth, and fair play. It seems from the message of the Almighty that it is fairness, it is justice that is the starting point of uh, a religious personality. If you are a religious person, genuinely, uh, you've got to be fair. Fair in taking decisions, fair in what you speak, fair in the manner you deal with people. It's not easy to do. However, when you have your target objective very clear in your mind despite your weaknesses and shortcomings you have the advantage the privilege of at least attempting to come close to your target come close to your objective the almighty is clarifying highlighting the fact that believers are expected to be firm in doing justice in their lives. And they should be just and fair in a manner that they are doing it for God. They are becoming God's representatives while being just. Uh, what it essentially means is that while we are doing justice, we are doing it for the sake of God and we are doing it in a manner that others can see from our conduct, from the manner we behave, that that's what God wants from all humans. We are representing God and while representing Him, we are showing to others that God the Almighty, our Creator, wants that living in this life, we must always be fair and just. Uh, it seems that it is this behavior of being just or otherwise that decides as to whether we are acceptable in the eyes of God, whether God is pleased with us or not. Most certainly, as believers, we pray to the Almighty, we fast, we go through all the different rituals and expectations of the Sharia that have been given to us. However, doing everything that religion expects from us would not help us in coming close to God quite as much as being fair and just would do. Or conversely, one might say, that we will not be able to pray properly. We will not be able to fast properly, discharge our religious obligations properly if we are not going to be just, if we are not going to be fair. And in order for us to be just and fair, we don't have to be uh, judges of uh, different courts. It's not 
an obligation which only a few people are expected to discharge. It's not something which the head of the state or those who are at the helm of the affairs, only they are expected to do. Every individual is confronted with situations, occasions, every day, wherein either you are going to be fair or you are going to be unfair. Either you are going to be just or you are going, you're going to be unjust. The Almighty has mentioned it absolutely clearly that as far as believers are concerned, they are expected to be absolutely fair. That should be their hallmark. That should be their prominent feature. Um, whether they are taking decisions, whether they are making statements, whether they are behaving, they have to be fair. As I said, it's easier said than done. However, once we know that to be fair is what we are expected to, to do, what we are expected to uh, uh, ensure, uh, we at least have the goal, the objective right in front of us. Now, we are going to go against this principle. We will sometimes find ourselves doing things which are not particularly fair. They are not justice. However, as soon as we will realize what we are doing is wrong, is unfair, we will correct ourselves. We will see our performance in the light of this important criterion. Now, the inter interesting thing is that even though both um, verses are talking about exactly the same expectation. Toward the later part of these verses, you find that the Almighty is making two different descriptions. In verse 135 of uh, Surah An-Nisa, the Almighty is saying, Ya amanu kunu bil shuhada lillah. Believers, be firm on justice, becoming representatives of the Almighty in doing so. And then goes on to say, Walau ala anfusikum avil walidaini wal akrabi. Even though in doing so, you are going against your own self-interests, interests of your parents or those of your relatives. In other words, the Almighty is clarifying that it's not going to be an easy task. It's not, it's not going to be smooth sailing. You will find that when you will try to be just, your own interests would stop you from doing so. The interests of your parents would stop you from doing so. Uh, your relatives, your attachment to them, your attachment to your friends, etc. They are going to stop you, prevent you from being fair and just. Uh, unless you know what the obstacles are, unless you know uh, the hurdles that are there in achieving your objectives, you will not be able to achieve them going to be only a desire, a wish and nothing more which will be unachievable. So the Almighty is telling the truth and following it and being fair and just, we will have to overcome uh, the difficulty, the challenge of, uh, of our own self-interests and those of our uh, relatives parents, etc. The verse, that is verse 135 of uh, Surah An-Nisa goes on also to say Fala hawa anta dilu. So, do not follow your desires lest you stay away from being just. Lest you become unfair. That is, it is our desires that cause us to be unfair. We get emotional. We get emotionally inclined towards something. 
we have our self interests which cause us to make statements to behave in a manner which is uh, not fair and just when the almighty is making this statement expecting from us to be fair and just without clarifying what justice is what it means is that he knows that we know what justice is uh we don't need to have uh, an elaborate uh training that we 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 would go through in order for us to know what is justice it is in there inside our our conscience a very clear understanding of whether what we are doing is fair or not so it is important that we should always look inwards to decide as to whether what we are saying or doing is fair or not uh quite often it so happens that we are very strongly inclined emotionally inclined uh to prove something right even though deep inside we know that it's not right and uh, therefore uh it's a very good idea that we be careful we should think and reflect before we decide we should be very careful while we are speaking more particularly when we are speaking about issues individuals matters where we are expressing our opinions it's not necessary that while we are being fair we are agreeing with everybody else and it's also not necessary that in being fair we disagree with anybody else it's just that you know you've got to go by the voice of your conscience which never deceives you the other verse verse 8 of surah al maida chapter 5 mentions as i said exactly the same thing there is a slight difference in wording ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu believers kunu qawwamina lillah be firm for the sake of god shuhada bil qist becoming his representatives in implementing justice and fair play the verse moves on to mention another thing another factor which prevents people from being just so it says wala yajrimannakum shanan qaumin ala allah taadilu let not enmity of a nation incline you to be unfair aidilu be fair o aqrabul taqwa it is the closest to god consciousness uh it so happens that we during the conduct of our lives have some people who are our friends ideals favorites and there are others with whom we disagree very strongly and we start hating them for one reason or the other and that is again another cause of becoming unfair and unjust the almighty says let not the enmity of a nation incline you to be unfair in other words uh it should not be the individual and your past uh, record past affiliation with him uh, whether positive or negative that should de- should decide uh, what opinion you would form about him or her uh it should be pure merit on the basis of which you should take your decisions uh that's what a believer has to do and for that obviously you don't have to fight anybody else more than you have to fight yourself your own desires your own inclinations your own prejudices etc while staying in this country for a few days i have uh, realized something which i 
always used to feel but being a part of the society for a few for a while makes your realization even stronger we muslims uh, behave in a manner which shows that uh, we are very fond of our culture we are very strongly attached to our traditions uh there's nothing wrong in it but when you are emotionally attached to a way of life what you do is that you try to assign to it all goodness you try to show and prove everything that you do is virtue is good and everything different from what you do is evil is unworthy of being uh, given any uh, any serious thought serious uh, acclaim uh, the fact of the matter is that it's not just important for the sake of uh, our own self development purification that we need to be just and fair in every matter uh, it is also important for the sake of uh, delivering disseminating god's message to others uh quite often we uh, are under a wrong impression that delivering god's message means delivering speeches talking to people proving them wrong presenting our arguments uh in a manner that they appear stronger than their arguments etc uh they're all important but quite frankly the most important thing that we need to do in order for the almighty's message to get across to others properly is that we be fair we tell people through our behavior that we believe in a god we believe in a message of god which is pure which is coming from him because it has made us become absolutely fair uh it doesn't it doesn't incline us to do in injustice to anybody so it's this behavior uh of the of the believer which is going to cause people to be attracted towards god's message because uh uh if we are unfair if we are biased if we are overly attached to our views our traditions no matter whether they are emerging from religion or not uh it's not going to impress people uh finally this verse that is verse 8 of surah al-maida is mentioning another important important fact god's policy which is aydilu huwa aqrabu lit-taqwa be fair it is the closest to taqwa to god consciousness god consciousness is a feeling is an attitude based on the realization that god is there and that realization is something that you we cannot have uh by just wishing it it's something that we earn by behaving properly feelings are not something that you can have on your own feelings get created feelings happen they emerge and they emerge because god allows them to emerge now the behavior and attitude of god consciousness taqwa is something the almighty is telling us uh you can get if you are fair if you do adil if you do justice so the quran says aidilu be fair wa aqrabu lit taqwa that behavior of justice and fair play 
is closest to taqwa. That is, if you're going to be fair, you will become God conscious. So obviously we would all want to become God conscious, muttaqi. And the way we can do it is that we be fair and just in our dealings with others. Conversely, there is no way, there is no way we can become God conscious no matter how much we pray, no matter how much we uh, seemingly apparently become pious, if we are unfair in our dealings. May the Almighty enable us to become fair and just in our dealings with others and may He enable us to become God conscious as a consequence. Now we move on to the second part of uh, our program wherein I make an attempt to mention some aspect of our religion which needs clarification. Uh, remember we were talking about Sunnah. What is Sunnah? And uh, what are the different views about Sunnah? And I mentioned uh, in my earlier presentations that although on the one hand it's very clear and unanimously agreed upon by Muslims as to what the Quran is and where to get the Quran from. It's a text and the text is intact from A to Z. But the same is not true, unfortunately, with regard to Sunnah. Not all Muslims have the same view and opinion about Sunnah. I mentioned about Sunnah in my earlier presentation that a large number of Muslims believe that the Prophet, may God's mercy be on him, whatever he did, whatever he said, whatever he silently approved, all constitutes Sunnah. I mentioned the arguments, religious arguments of the people who hold this view. And then I mentioned uh, the criticism that is there on this point of view. Uh, today I am going to mention uh, the second view, which is the view of the Quranists. Uh, those people who think that there is no Sunnah, there is no uh, source of religious learning except the Quran. Uh, those who hold this view have their arguments. I will mention those arguments and then I will mention uh, the counter arguments which uh, are presented by the people who do not agree with the view of the Quranists. Uh, Quranists are a group which if you search for them uh, on the Google search, uh, you would find articles on them in Wikipedia and elsewhere, uh, which would inform you that there is a pretty good number of Muslims now who are turning uh, to be Quranists, who are uh, accepting the claim that for a Muslim to follow Islam, there is only one source that needs to be understood and followed, and that is the Quran. Now, what are their arguments? And briefly, I'm going to mention them. Uh, they say that in Surah number 18, Surah Al-Kahf, verse 110, the Almighty is saying, addressing the Prophet, may God's mercy be on him, Qul innama ana basharum mithlukum. The Prophet say, say to them, I am only a human like you. You ilayya. Wahi, divine revelation has been revealed upon me. That is, the only difference between you and me is that 
there is this vahi that has been revealed upon me and that makes me uh, the prophet representative of God. Their understanding argument is that the prophet may God's mercy be on him. He has delivered the vahi, the divine revelation that was revealed upon him uh, to the rest of the mankind in the form of the Quran. Now that the job has been done, there is no further need for Muslims to uh, look for any other source. The other argument that they present is from Surah al maida Surah number 5, chapter 67, uh, sorry, verse 67. Uh, chapter number 5, Surah number 5, verse 67. The verse says, Ya Yuhar Rasul, O Messenger, Balligh ma unzila ilayk. You deliver, convey whatever has been revealed to you. Fa'illam tafal, for if you will not do it, fama balafta risalata. You will not have discharged your obligations as a messenger. In other words, the Quran is telling um, the believer that it is the divine revelation. It is the Quran which needed to be disseminated, spread across, which the Prophet did and did it well. And now it is up to the people who have received the Quran to understand it and follow it. The job of the messenger was to deliver the message. If he wouldn't have done it, God forbid, he wouldn't have discharged his obligations. What it means is, that now that he has discharged his obligation of delivering the message, uh, he's done his job. Now it's the book which needs to be understood and to be followed. A third argument is what is presented from chapter 6, Surah Al-An'am, verses 154 and 155. In these verses, the Quran is clarifying that the books of God, whether they are in the form of Torah or whether they are in the form of Quran, they carry guidance which is complete. The words are in Torah, for instance, God Almighty revealed Tafseel Ali Kulli Shay. Tafseel, clarification, details of everything. Now, if the Quran is claiming that God's books contain details of everything, then obviously you don't need guidance from outside the Quran. When the Quran itself is saying that whatever you need, you will find from the Quran. Uh, why should anybody go outside the Quran to get religious guidance and information? If he or she is going to do it, it's going to misguide uh, and not guide. That's the that's the understanding. Now, how would those uh, who disagree with the point of view of the Quranists uh, respond to their to their uh, understanding to their claims. Uh, obviously, if the claim of the Quranists is to be rejected on the basis of Sunnah, on the basis of Hadith, uh, it would not help because. The Quranists, they do not accept Sunnah or Hadith as desirable, acceptable, reliable sources of religious learning. So the only way they can be helped in understanding the fact that there is guidance outside the Quran uh, as well is by letting them know through the Quran, Quranic verses 
that the Quran itself is clarifying, is giving strong reasons for the reader to believe that there was guidance available outside the Quran as well from God Almighty. Now, in order for, for this uh, purpose to be achieved, there are certain verses which are often quoted. For example, there is this passage in chapter 66, Surah Tahrim, in verse 3, wherein the Quran is informing us that there was an incident whereby the Prophet, may God's mercy be on him, confided with one of his wives a secret. And uh, he, he told her not to share it with anybody else. A few days later, what happened was that the secret, secret was shared with another wife of the Prophet, may God's mercy be on him. Why did it happen? Well, it's quite natural. It wasn't that the particular wife who had that information did it knowingly or deliberately. You tend to forget that you had actually been asked not to share the information. The information you have is, is so interesting that, uh, uh, you know, the memory of uh, the commitment that it is not to be shared with others is lost and the information is shared. The Prophet, may God's mercy be on him, was informed by the Almighty that the uh, information has leaked out. So, he told his wife, whom he had given the information, that she's already shared with somebody else. That wife was uh, surprised and she spontaneously instinctively asked who told you obviously she must have felt that the lady with whom she shared this information must have uh, broken the secret but the Quran says the Prophet may God's mercy on, be on him he responded by saying Nabba'ani al-Aleem al-Khabir the one who is all knowing all informed he has given me this information. He has informed me about it. That is, God has told me that you shared the information that I give, gave you for you to keep it to yourself with somebody else. Now, we do not have any verse from the Quran which says, O Prophet, your wife, has shared the information that you wanted to keep to herself, her to keep to herself with somebody else. There's no verse anywhere. Which leads one to, to believe that the Quran, that the Almighty uh, communicated with the Prophet even outside the Quran. He communicated with him and that communication has not become a part of the Quran. That is what the Quran itself is clarifying. Another, another passage which uh, is quite often mentioned uh, in response to the arguments of the Quranists is verse 9 of uh, Surah 62, Surah al Jumma, wherein the Almighty is saying that, Ya ayyuhal Believers, when a call is made for prayers uh, on Jummah, you leave aside all your worldly engagements, uh, your, your trade, etc. And you move towards, rush towards the remembrance of God. That is for, better for you. Uh, so that you may, may, may prosper. And when the prayer is over, then you spread across in the land, and look for God's bounties. 
the question that is raised is that what is it all about? What is the call for prayers on Fridays? What happens on Fridays? Where is it mentioned in the Quran? Nowhere. In actual fact, if you read these verses properly, the understanding that you get is that there was an arrangement of Friday prayers that was already going on before these verses were revealed. And the Almighty is telling believers to take this ritual, this worship, collective worship, seriously. So, uh, the mention of Friday prayers is only in a way that the Quran is giving a certain instruction regarding a certain exercise which was already underway. Which was, which was already happening. The Prophet, may Allah's mercy be on him, had already started the proceedings of Juma prayers. Uh, why didn't the Quran uh, describe what Juma prayers are? Oh, because everybody knew it. Why, why should something that is quite obvious to everyone be explained? And moreover, a an exercise which has to be done physically, practically, uh, cannot be explained in words. That exercise, more particularly acts of worship and rituals, they are followed, they are viewed, observed and the practice is followed. So, it is again submit, submitted before uh, the Quranists that uh, look here the Quran is clarifying that uh, there were certain acts happening in the society of Medina on which the Quran is making comments in a way that those activities, those acts of worship were very much a part of uh, the religion that was given to believers and God is expressing his displeasure on the behavior of certain people who were not willing to follow those, that exercise. Then we have this mention in Surah An-Nisa, Surah number 4, verse 103, wherein the Almighty is saying, Inna salata kanat kitabam Indeed, prayers have been <clears throat> made obligatory on believers at their appointed times. What are those prayers? What are their timings? Where is it written in the Quran? Where has it been given clearly in the Quran that, uh, look here, believers, you've got to say your prayers five times a day. Uh, and these are the timings. Nowhere. And yet, the Quran is emphasizing that prayers are required to be said in their apportioned, appointed times. In other words, the Quran is confirming that the system of prayer that was given by the Prophet, may God's mercy be on him, which uh, believers are going through already, uh, they are obligatory and they are obligatory to be said in different times, parts of the day, without mentioning what, what those parts are, except for one or two mentions which are indirect, honestly. There are people who who try to present verses from <clears throat> Surah Hud, chapter 11, and Surah Bani Israel, chapter 17, uh, claiming that uh, there is a mention of timings. Well, if it is, it's only, it's only general, indirect, uh, and not very precise. Finally, quite apart from many other arguments, there is another very interesting argument presented by people who do not accept the Quranist view. They present verse 58 of Surah Nur, chapter 24. Chapter 24, verse 58 says <clears throat> that believers must observe three times of privacy for others, more particularly the couples. Even 
children and people who are otherwise very closely linked with with the couples the, the three times of privacy are mentioned in a manner two of them are linked with two prayers so the quran mentions min qabli salatil fajr before fajr prayer you are not allowed to enter somebody else's room without seeking permission and knocking at the door wa min baadi salatil isha and after the isha prayer now what is fajr prayer there is only this mention in this surah in this verse and nothing else and what is isha prayer after which you are not allowed to enter the rooms of others without seeking permission uh, no mention why because it was already clear it was already mentioned uh, in a source outside the quran so i mentioned before you <clears throat> the quranist view and their arguments uh, some of the arguments that they present and i have also mentioned the counter arguments that are mentioned uh, to show to the quranists that their view that islam is to be understood only from the quranic text and from nowhere else that view is not correct now i am available for <clears throat> questions if there are any jazakallah khair Uh, I have uh, some uh, quick question about the uh, earlier description of the of the Surah Nisa uh, verse. Uh, I think it's one thirty-five. One thirty-five. Ah, one thirty-five. In in that verse, Allah is addressing to common people uh, for causing. uh islamic justice or the social justice or domestic justice or or is a overall picture of uh, justice uh i mean uh, which type of justice allah is referring in that verse all justice social political domestic and collective you see justice doing justice is an attribute it's a quality an individual is either fair or is unfair a person who is unfair in his dealings with others at the individual level cannot be fair when he is given the responsibility of uh, running the affairs of a, of a collectivity of a, of a society of a country so the expectation of the almighty is from everyone you know in surah anam 6th chapter the almighty while describing uh, the moral principles which ought to be followed by all believers one of the thing one of the things that he mentions is why is a qultum when you speak fadilu be fair so this justice and fair play is desired by the almighty from us even when we are speaking even when we are thinking even when we are forming opinions i said uh, probably day before yesterday in a gathering that when you are forming religious opinions how on earth is it possible for a believer to say that i belong to a certain sect all right it's not possible that you say just i belong to a certain political party and therefore uh, i cannot have any views other than the views that my sect or my party is presenting uh while forming opinions while making statements while dealing with others uh we've always required to be fair and just most certainly if somebody is given the charge to run the affairs of a collectivity of an organization an institution or the society in at large then the obligation of being just and fair becomes even more stringent and the expectations are even higher likewise obviously is the case case of judges who are dispensing justice but this requirement is 
from all people. Uh, I see. Uh, it does mean that the, all the judges uh, in the society must have a high ranks than the other stakeholders in the society because judges, they have to make uh, decisions, uh, maintain, maintain the balance of uh, different values and good versus evil within the society. Is enough? Most certainly. Judges, uh, whoever are required to take decisions about uh, the disputes that come to them, uh, disputes of people, uh, they should be given a position in the society, uh, by the society, wherein the temptations for them to be unfair are are minimized, uh, eliminated. They should be well paid, they should, be, they should not be approachable for being pressurized, they should never be allowed to be threatened, etc. Uh, because the more uh, they are at ease, at liberty, and are free to decide, the more it's likely that they are going to be to, to, to give justice. Uh, no justice can be provided uh, with at, at gunpoint um, when a person uh, is in need of wealth uh, to take care of his needs. Uh, so, you know, they need to be taken care of uh, properly and they should be absolutely independent because their task is, is more important. However, what I'm emphasizing is that it's not just them, but everybody else, all believers, if they are believers, they are expected to be fair and just. Yeah, and the last question in this connection is, uh, is that, is that uh, justice referring in both verses, which you have elaborated, are encouraging to implementation of Islamic punishments or Islamic justice system, which uh, ulema and scholars, uh, they are talking about and they are discussing to implement. Is that also referring or this is a ge general perception Allah is talking about? You see, when I will answer your question, I will be expected to be just and fair while answering it. Because I'll form some opinion. That opinion can be wrong. But God wants me to be fair and just when I answer your question. So I'm just giving you an example. That it's not just that there is an ultimate uh, form of justice that is required to be implemented. Sometimes it may happen that a person is apparently religious as, and is implementing some requirement of religion but is being unfair. My ordinary opinion is that when it comes to the question of implementing Islamic uh, punishments, uh, there are two things, there are two principles that need to be considered. One is that uh, Islam has, uh, the Quran has uh, clearly mentioned that Muslims, whenever they des decide their collective affairs, uh, they do it on the basis of mutual consultation. Amruhum shura bainahum. So, Muslims or their representatives, in our case, their parliamentarians, should come together and they should decide that when the Almighty has given us uh, certain punishments to implement uh, in response to uh, crimes committed by people, uh, let's introduce those punishments because obviously they are from God. And who can be more fair than God? Uh, however, the other principle that matters have to be decided on the basis of mutual consultation has also got to be followed. Now, there could be one of the two things that might happen. The majority of the Muslims, or maybe by their unanimity, might decide that we are going to, uh, let's say, amputate the hands hand of a thief or there's going to be capital punishment for somebody who is a killer or uh, the one who adulterates is going to be flogged with 100 lashes, etc. Uh, obviously, when 
the parliament decides on the basis of mutual consultation. The first principle that Muslims, their decisions are based on mutual consultation is going to be satisfied. And the second principle requirement that God's laws must get implemented will also be satisfied. However, if there are Muslims in their majority in the parliament who decide against it and they do it because uh, they don't want to implement justice, I implement the Sharia, then those who are convinced that what has happened is wrong should teach and preach to the common man who elect those people to not elect them in the, in the future and replace them with people who would want to see the Sharia getting implemented in collective matters. And if that doesn't happen, then they should continue to teach, continue to invite people to fear God and to implement His will in the collective matters. However, there is a second principle which those who are deciding these matters must take into consideration. And that is that while implementing hudud, that is the punishments uh, prescribed by the Almighty, we must make sure first and foremost that the society has been cleansed of those uh, inclinations, temptations which cause people to commit crimes. For example, if the gap between rich and poor, the disparity is huge. There are some people who are living uh, lives of luxury and there are many people who do not even, uh, who are not even able to have two meals a day. Uh, then this gap has got to be first lessened, uh, shortened before uh, the punishment of amputating a thief's hand is to be implemented and obviously similar is going to be uh, the case with uh, uh, the preparation that needs to be done before implementing uh, the other punishments. Amazing, uh, amazing description and uh, I believe it is also related to the people and nations or the, or the groups who glorify one events in history and uh, could not maintain that justice uh, for, for what actually it happened. The same thing, uh, people and group and communities, they bashing uh, about something happened in the history and they could not maintain the justice uh, about the facts. Is all uh, disasters have come in our society, in overall world, have produces a lot of uh, racist community, terrorism, uh, creation of cults group. Uh, many people think that they are the consequences of uh, injustice in the world or in certain society. Maradip Sahib, you have, uh, you have uh, concluded from what I have, what the truth is, that we are unfair in forming opinions. We exaggerate in mentioning events, stories, and the end result is that there is injustice, there is tyranny, there is cruelty in this world. If people were to become just in forming opinions and they, they would know that it's not just that uh, a judge is to dispense justice, everybody has to be just. You know, a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law, they also have to be just in dealing with each other, a son and a father and so on. Then uh, this life would be uh, far better, this world would be a far better place than what it is now. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I can request any of participants if they have any question. Please feel free to ask from Dr. Sir. We have a very limited time. I think 
few minutes now. Can I read a question from here, from the Facebook, if we don't have somebody? Yes, In our society, big number of people consider that we can't understand Quran without someone's experts, some experts' help. And in this way, practically, they're following certain people and not Quran by themselves. What are your views in this regard? I agree with you. I think uh, a common man most certainly cannot understand the Quran directly. We all need teachers. We all need people who guide us. However, that is one thing, one reality. The other reality is that those teachers are also humans. They are also prone to err they are also likely to form incorrect opinions. Therefore, even when we are students, even when our knowledge and ability is limited, we still are expected to be again fair. You know, the key word is justice and fair play. We need to form opinions in a way which is just and which is correct. So, uh, while understanding the Quran also, the same principle applies. I may have a teacher who has been teaching me for the last 20, 30 years and I'm so very impressed by him. But in certain matters, there's somebody else who comes who's absolutely newcomer to me and tells me that what your teacher is saying is not making sense. I am expected to be open-minded in order to be, for me to be fair in deciding whether this relatively new scholar for me, from, from my point of view, is making more sense. So that really has to be the principle all across. And I quite agree with you that uh, many people, uh, they follow their scholars, uh, what they understand from the Quran, and they think that they are following the Quran, even though they are actually following the opinions of their scholars, which needs to be corrected. And, uh, you know, incidentally, what we have discussed today, the two Quranic verses, they are the key so even while forming religious opinions, we are expected to be fair. Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. Uh, we have seen in, in our current nations in the world uh, who are more successful, more developed, more educated. They have developed an amazing justice system in their True. countries. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And they have able to manage their different communities within the countries in justice way. And that's why they are more happy, they are productive, they are financially rich, they, their values based more rich. Absolutely. Uh, like the other societies. Absolutely. And it seems that God is helping them and enabling them to yeah. make, make progress. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, and also the justice is independent of religion. And, right. Uh, Anybody will follow the values and uh, uh, these things, they can achieve it. But Allah will be more uh, helpful for the believers. Is that correct? If they want to implement a justice system. Maratip Sahib, you've started a very new subject and which is in itself needs details, but a very, <laughs> very brief answer. You yes. see, God is more just than all of us. And therefore, whether it is this worldly life or the life hereafter, he is going to deal with human beings justly in a fair manner. I and you were born Muslims. God knows he caused many others to be born as non-Muslims. He knows everything about you and me and about others. And that knowledge of his is going to enable him to decide and he will decide absolutely fairly. This is a good news, but this is also a very scary news. We should not have wishful thinking about ourselves. God is kind, but God is just as well. No doubt. Uh, I think that uh, we have... Uh, uh, 
across the uh, 10 o'clock and it's 10 or 10. I think you have to go to I have to, yes. Uh, so to the Birmingham as well. We are very thankful, Thank Dr. You. Saab. You gave your valuable time and uh, uh, even you made a commitment when you are very busy in foreign tours. Uh, 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 Maradim Saab, actually, I was... I, I, I had to do it. I was embarrassed because in the last two cases, somehow our, our programs could not take place. So, you know, I made it a point that, you know, this time round, I must do it because, you know, we've That's not been we having really it. Inshallah, we really Inshallah, we'll, we'll be more regular. And okay. please remind me about the uh, information that I must uh, pass on to, to the people in this country that we are having these okay. online classes. Inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, many thanks. To, Thank uh, we will, Inshallah, come next Saturday with Dr. Munir Ahmed in Urdu class session. And uh, please uh, pass to our Islam study circle sessions information to any of the event which uh, Dr. Khalid uh, is currently conducting. So that is a very high time where we can motivate the people to our weekly Islam study Inshallah. sessions. Inshallah. Uh, Zakallah. Zakallah. Uh, Inshallah. We'll see you next Saturday. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.